Good morning. Good morning. Grace and peace to you from God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ, and welcome to the Grace Place as we gather here today to worship the living Jesus. I only have three announcements this morning, uh, beginning with noting that today's altar flowers were in honor of Betty Hamill's 90th birthday, which is actually tomorrow. And I will remind you, too, that one to four this afternoon, a, a drop-by <coughs> celebration at her home. Uh, the Friendship Club will gather for a Dutch Street lunch this Wednesday at 11 o'clock at the Chop House in Franklin Square down for Farragut. Then my last uh, announcement is that offering envelopes for 2023 on the table in the narthex will be picked up at your convenience. With all that said, let us now prepare our hearts to worship the risen Jesus. Take your hymnals, turn to 293, praise the one who breaks the darkness.
Father, Lord Jesus, and most precious Holy Spirit, we are thankful and grateful to be gathered here in your house this morning. It may be cold outside, but the warmth of fellowship in Christ will keep our souls and our lives warm in here this day. And we praise you for that fellowship and that warmth that we share. We thank you for the opportunity to come and worship you, to hear your word, to sing your praises, to visit with one another. But mostly, Father, we, change, we thank you for the opportunity to gather before you so that your Holy Spirit can change us and help us become more and more and more like Jesus. And that's our prayer this very day. In your holy name, amen. Now if you'll take the bulletin insert and join in singing, Who is he in yonder star? Cited in unison the Apostles' Creed, which says, I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who is conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sent us on the right hand of God, the Father Almighty. 
and this he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. You may be seated. You do so. Join me in this time of prayer. Almighty God, once again we, we come before your throne of grace, humbled by your majesty, by your power, by your very nature. But more than all things that humble us, Father, it's your grace and mercy. It's your holiness and righteousness. You are flawless, and we are flawed. You are sinless, and we are sinners. So, Father, as we stand before you this morning, we want to confess our sins. We, we acknowledge, Lord, that we fall short of your glory, that there's things in our lives that ought not be there. It varies from person to person what that sin may be, but all of our sin seems to have the same common cause. That is, we desire, desire our will over your will. So forgive us of our sins, Father, and help us to surrender ourselves, our will, to you, so that sin becomes less and less and less a part of our lives as we become more and more and more like Jesus. And Father, with our, with our sins now forgiven, we can worship you in truth and spirit, and part of our worship is to lift up prayer requests. We lift them up to you because we know that you have the power and the ability and the desire to bring about good things in the lives of those that we lift up in prayer, those on our hearts and minds, those on our prayer list, even those things, Father, that we've not dared to utter out loud. You know the needs of our heart, and we're just asking that you reach down with your grace and you flood our lives and you flood the lives of all that we are lifting up so that physical healing may come, financial wellness may come, relationships can be put back together and mended. All the things that break us, Father, can be restored, and we trust you to do that because we know that your desire for us, your desire is to make us like Jesus, and he wasn't broken. We desire not to be broken either, Father. We desire for the sin in our life to be wiped away and then kept away. So give us through the power of your Holy Spirit the ability to resist temptation so that, again, we become more and more and more like Jesus. We become more like our Lord who taught us to pray, Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done in earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For mine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Mm -hmm.
permission to give generously this morning to found in Paul's letter to the second Corinthians where he writes, For you know the generous act of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, yet for your sakes he became poor, so that by his poverty you might become rich. Let us now honor God through our giving. that you have blessed us with your generosity throughout our lives. And Lord, we're so thankful and blessed that you've created here in this congregation a group of people that's taking on your characteristic of being gracious and generous. Father, and so we, we thank you for each and every gift that has been given this day, whether it was dropped in the plates this morning or come in the mail this last week. 
We thank you for each gift. We ask you to bless them and anoint them and that there be enough to do all that you have us to do and a little leftover just so we can be amazed at your goodness. So again, we praise you for your generosity and the generosity of these, your people, in your holy name. Amen. You may be seated as you do so. <coughs> Miss Rebecca will be coming for our children's message, so I'm going to ask the kids to come forward. And then at the end of the message, you'll go to children's church with Miss Sarah, and then Miss Joanna will join you soon thereafter. Good morning. There are so many precious children here. It just warms my heart. How are you doing? Good? Oh, good. You know what? You know what? You can tell that I'm a member of the choir, can't you? Because I have a robe on. Well, we just sang a song, and that song has been on my mind like all week. And what's it called? Who can read? What does it say? Only God. We just sang that song, Only God. And I've been thinking about that song all week. And you know what? The words of that song, the first thing they say is, Only God can move a mountain. Only God can calm the sea. And I have, I've been thinking about that, and I have some questions for you today. And I will tell you that you may know the answer. Okay. Who made the moon? God. Right, and let's say this. Only God. Only God. Only God. Okay. Who made the sun? God. Only God. Who made the stars? God. And let's say, only God. God. Only God. Okay, who made the mountains? Only God. Who made the ocean? Only God. Who made the whales in the ocean? Only God. He makes. Who made the sky? Only God. Who made the sky? God. Only God. Who made you? Only God. Who is faithful and keeps all of his promises? Uh, Only, God. Only God. Who can give us hearts that love God? Only. Only God. Yes, God is almighty. He is most holy. And he is most wise. And I am opening up the scriptures today to Psalm 145. And I want to read this to you from the Psalms. I will honor you, my God, the King. I will praise your name forever and ever. Every day I will praise you. I will praise your name forever and ever. How, how many, when do we do it? When do we praise his name? Every day, every day. Lord, you are great. You are really worthy of praise. No one can completely understand how great you are. Are. The Lord is faithful and will keep all of his promises. He is loving towards everything he has made. Is he loving towards you? Yes. The Lord is right in everything he does. He is loving toward everything he has made. It says that again. The Lord is ready to help all those who call out to him. He helps those who really mean it when they call out to him. I will praise the Lord with my mouth. Let every creature praise his holy name forever and ever. Let's say, praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Let's do it a little bit louder. Praise the Lord. One more time. Praise the Lord. Yes, let us pray. Lord, we praise you because you are so faithful. 
you are loving towards all you have made and that is us and everything you've made we praise you this morning because you are great you are mighty and you are all wise in jesus name amen let's do one more praise
every time I stand behind this table, as a Cumberland Presbyterian, I am privileged to say that this table does not belong to First Cumberland Presbyterian Church, nor does it belong to the denomination of which we are connected. But rather, this is the Lord's table. And at the Lord's table, all who are present this day are invited to come. I will offer one word of uh, instruction as the elders that are going to serve today come forward. And that is, due to COVID, we are still doing it the same way. You'll find two cups. The bottom cup has the bread, the top cup, the juice. Once this is served, I ask you to hold it, and then we will take the bread together and the juice together in just a few moments. And... Come on, Elvis. <laughs> I thought I said that part. Maybe I did.
celebrate the Passover meal. The Passover meal was a full meal, a Seder meal. But central to the Passover meal was the breaking of the bread and the drinking of the wine. And Jesus transformed those two elements from Passover to what we now know as Holy Communion. He took a piece of the Passover bread and he broke it. And he said, this is my body broken for you. Let us pray. Father, we thank you for the broken body of Christ, for the body that brings about our forgiveness, our salvation, our healing. Scripture tells us that by his stripes we are healed. By his brokenness we are healed. We praise you for the broken body of Christ. In your holy name, amen. You may pass. Later in that same meal, Jesus took a, a cup of wine, traditionally thought to be the third cup of the Passover meal, the cup of bitter wine, the wine that would remind the, the Hebrew people of their enslavement in Israel, I mean in Egypt. Now it had been centuries since they had been enslaved in Egypt, but when they drank that cup, somehow mysteriously it seemed to take them back to that day. For us, this cup is a bitter reminder of our sin. We've been washed in the blood. Our sins have been forgiven. But let this cup of, of juice remind us just exactly what that forgiveness and salvation calls. For it is the blood of Christ that washes away our sin. Let us pray. Father, we thank you. We praise you for the blood of Christ that not only washes away our sin, but makes us whole, makes us white as snow. We praise you for your salvation. In your holy name I pray. good, you are gracious, and you are faithful. Lord, I'm overwhelmed at your goodness this morning, and I, I ask that above all else that your face be lifted high before all of us and that we see your goodness in the name of Jesus. Amen. So I feel really... Um, grateful and very humbled to be able to share my piece of his story with you today. Um, so if you'll just bear with me for a minute, I'm going to just give you a little snapshot of my life. So I was raised in a very poor southern town, um, very unstable family. There was abuse, there was domestic violence, and um, sorry, there was mental illness, and there was always a crisis, and um, so when I was a teenager, I'm sorry, I'm just like shaking a lot. <laughs> when I was a teenager, I was somehow connected to a church youth group, and I was really kind of drawn to those people. I, um, 
they were a lot different than I was. Um, their lives were a lot different than what I had seen in my family. And about that same time, I started to babysit for a town doctor, and she realized very quickly that there was something up in my family, and she knew that I needed help. And so she arranged with a high school teacher and the minister's family at this church to help me essentially run away from home. And after running away, I was hidden for a few days while the dust settled and the legalities were taken care of. And then I was provided a home with that minister's family. I thought I'd won the lottery. It was really different, really different. <coughs> there was a lot of seeds planted in my life during that period and I decided that I was gonna be a Christian. And I learned how to do Christian things very quickly and very well. So with this family's help, I finished high school, I went far away to a Christian college, I married a wonderful Christian man, and we established a Christian home. And I was really proud to be a survivor. My upbringing had taught me self-protection and it had taught me self-sufficiency, and no one worked harder than me to get what I wanted in life. But these self-protective tendencies often exhibited in negative ways. Most notably, I had a terrible anger problem. It reared itself often. And I also had a really deep mistrust of people. I, I never felt good enough. And so I worked very, very hard to become a type A high achiever. I tried to obtain security and happiness with doing good things. And I lived a very recognizable Christian lifestyle. I was a good, moral person. I attended church and I followed all the rules. But to be honest, I never felt the presence of God. I didn't know the living Jesus. I didn't have his power in my life. And I didn't even know there could be power. I had no understanding of his truth at all. Although I followed all the religious rules, I was simply using them to further my goals. I was using them to keep order in my life, but I didn't see his light at all. His word was dry and meaningless to me. And I sat in church week after week without it ever making a difference in my life because I had no relationship with Jesus. And I never realized that things should be different. So then about 12 years into our marriage, through a series of events of which I now blame myself as much as anyone, I had a really bad experience in a church that left me reeling. And it allowed my deep mistrust of people to grow, especially Christian people. What happened was, in an attempt to deal with my childhood, with the help of lay counselors in the church, I experienced the power of darkness in a way that gave Satan a really firm foothold in my life. During that time, I uncovered a lot of things that I had forgotten about my childhood. It's true, you don't remember things. And I worked really hard to get rid of that baggage. I did everything, everything that I was advised to do. But after years of working with these people, and I mean years, I was completely consumed by the darkness, and I was not able to fix myself. And it was a really unbearable place, so I simply gave up and ran from that church. And I was very, very angry at that point because the church had failed me, God had failed me, and I had failed myself by giving my trust to those people, and I was also really angry at my husband because I felt like he had failed me because he hadn't given me any spiritual protection during that time. And anger completely consumed me. I was, I was broken. I was completely hopeless. And although church wasn't a safe place for me, we tried going to another church for a little while. But to be honest, I was so broken by religion, I just couldn't do it. So I quietly and unintentionally stopped going to church by volunteering to work, in at, the, to work at the hospital every Sunday. And Doug kept going to church. And 
I felt really lonely and isolated because of that, and that combined with my feelings like he hadn't protected me led to our marriage completely crumbling for a lot of years. So as things seemed to cave inward, what had first seemed unintentional became intentionally running from everything even remotely religious. If you asked me, I would still tell you that I was a Christian because I had a reputation to protect and being a Christian was part of my public identity. I still followed most of the rules, didn't go to church, but do you, do you know that it's really quite easy to pretend to be a Christian? All you have to do is say the right words. You have to do good things and, um, you know, occasionally maybe speak out about one of the big sins. But, but nobody knows because nobody really challenges you. We don't, we don't challenge each other. We don't get into each other's business. We don't ask each other what Jesus has been doing in our lives. So, so it's easy. But I'll tell you something, I wasn't about to let anybody know that I was falling apart. And I put on my Christian facade when I walked out of the door every day, and I carried on. I was, I was crumbling inside, and no one knew because I still presented very well on the outside. I continued to be a very high achiever. I was a strong businesswoman. I was driven. I was in control. And I was proud because I had created my own destiny by hard work. That's the American way, right? Hard work. And unless you knew me, and I made sure that no one really knew me, you would think that I had it all together spiritually and personally. But I was a complete fake, and God was about ready to rip off my mask. So deep inside, I knew I was in a very, I knew I was in a bad place. I, I often didn't sleep at night. I was having more and more angry outbursts, and I trusted no one. I hated myself, literally. Do you know that living a lie is really hard on a person's spirit? I knew that I didn't really have a relationship with, with this God of my religion, and I was actually aware of my sin, but I didn't think that God could forgive me for the things that I had done. And in regards to the things that had happened at that church... I was pretty sure I had committed the unpardonable sin. I was, I was convinced of it, actually. And I, I was full of shame. I was full of regret. And I was full of fear. I thought I was going to go to hell. I longed for things to be different. But I was really hopeless and miserable. And I, I had lost control. I didn't see any way out of the mess. And then Jesus intervened. So first he brought me to a place of utter despair in my 37-year marriage. The years emotionally separated had been really brutal for both of us. And when I was faced with the internal realization that we just needed to end it or we had to fix it, I finally agreed to the marriage counseling that Doug had been begging me to do for years. But it was under my conditions. So we ended up in a one-week marriage intensive far away from Knoxville with what I thought would be secular counseling. It was not. It was a really intense week. I was brutally honest with the counselors about everything because at that point I felt like I had little to lose. And they immediately picked up on my need to control and to fix things. I was still maintaining that I was a Christian, although at that point, I literally despised everything Christian. I felt like there was no power in the religion. I believed Christians to be judgmental, arrogant, and not authentic. I was describing myself. But throughout that week, they challenged me frequently as to whether or not I really believed in God's grace. And, you know, they, they just kept doing it over and over, and it made me so angry. <laughs> it made me so angry. But it put a sizable chink in the armor that I had placed around myself, and I actually became obsessed with proving to myself that I did understand grace. So fresh out of marriage counseling, God gave us the gift of COVID quarantine. 
So many of you know that we own a home care business and it was a terribly busy and chaotic time. And here I was trying to fall in love with my husband again, working hard to implement all the things that we had just learned, full, complete chaos around us, and unbeknownst to me, God started to draw him, me to himself. I was taking a lot of walks, AirPod intact, to relieve stress, and I stumbled upon a podcast by an old school radio teacher. Um, he taught a lot of grace. He was bold, he was um, non-judgmental, and he seemed authentic, and soon I found I couldn't even suck in his teachings fast enough. So over the next nine months, the Word of God, oh guys, the Word of God, it was like fire in my soul. It was like a hammer breaking the rock of my heart into pieces. And I listened repeatedly to these podcasts, and I was just drawn to his scriptures. And I read everything I could find on grace, and I couldn't reconcile what I was hearing. I couldn't reconcile it with this God that had been my religion for all of these years. How could it be so different? I mean, I had an idea that it should be different, but I didn't really know how, to, how it could be different. But in the midst of asking these questions, I, I started having this growing sense of truth, and I became really desperate for his word. And suddenly, I started to really care about who he was. He suddenly, his characteristics suddenly seemed really important to me. So I read that he was sovereign, and he was in charge. And everything in my life had passed through the filter of his hand. And I also read that his plan was a lot bigger than my life. And then I read that he was completely immutable. He never changes. He's good all the time, and I saw the same God in the Old Testament that I saw in the New Testament. And that unchanging nature was really comforting to me. And it really got my attention. And I was sensing that his word was actually his truth and his practical way of teaching and guiding me. I saw that he was really clear in his word about what he likes and what he doesn't like. And kind of like a parent, he was using his word to show me what he didn't like while he was still loving me. That was really kind of foreign to me. And suddenly his word started to become alive to me. It was alive. It was active. It was pricking my heart. And I just heard myself praying, God, give me more understanding of this. And then he showed me his love. It was beyond comprehension. It was steadfast. His love was greater than my sins. And he knew everything about me. He chose to love me anyway. And then that nothing that I could do was going to make him love me more or less. That was pretty big. I couldn't work for it. But I also was wondering about all the things that I had done. He was actually pretty determined to have me, and he started wooing me to himself. He was so determined to have me that he made arrangements for that before I was even born. And it was going to require the death of his son on the cross. And then everywhere I turned, I found grace. I read that salvation isn't a reward for doing good things, and it's a gift of grace when we believe so that we can't boast about it. Wow. If I couldn't work for it, how was I going to control it? And how had I missed that all of those years? So even though I had been religious throughout most of my life, and I had spent many years in church, I had literally lived the Christian lifestyle since I was a teenager. These truths were completely new to me. It was like the story of redemption was completely new to me. I had never heard it before. I had been sitting in those pews my entire life and had not heard the story of redemption in my spirit. And I was growing really frantic to understand it. 
how, what, what did I need to do? I, th- I couldn't figure out what I needed to do. It was like I was sitting in this dry desert with a water glass just out of my reach, and I couldn't get to it. You see, I had a veil over my mind that could only be removed by believing in Jesus, and I, I still couldn't believe that it was meant for me. Satan had blinded my mind to the good news of Jesus Christ. And I was completely helpless to fix myself. I begged God to reveal himself to me if I could actually be forgiven. But I had very strong lies in my mind. And I I didn't think that the cross was for me. It was for people who were worthy of it. And then over the course of about two weeks, beginning in late November 2020, God began to break through. He began to wake me up in the very early mornings where he wrestled with me himself over these truths. And he showed me his cross repeatedly. He took me to scripture after scripture, showing me the eternal truths of his character. And he emphasized repeatedly that not one word of his has ever failed. And then everything changed. When one very early morning, Jesus literally came for me himself. I sensed his presence in the room. He called me by name. He showed me his cross. And he whispered that I was already forgiven, but through his power, not mine. He made it clear that he was sovereign in every way. And as I sat there and argued with him about all the things that I had done, He reminded me that nothing I'd done surprised him. He was in that room to offer me life, and he literally gave me assurance that it was all true. His grace, his his word, his unchanging character, his cross, his cross. And I became instantly aware that there was nothing that I could do to work hard enough to get what he was offering. It was a free gift, but I had to take it. And at that very moment, the faith came from him to believe. It wasn't from me. The faith, I couldn't even get the faith myself. It had to come from him. And I I began to swim for an opening that had not been there before, straight into his arms of forgiveness. God did something supernaturally for me that day, and he broke chains that I could not break. It wasn't from my action, it was from his blood on the cross that I was able to get my freedom. And he saved me. He saved me that day. I didn't even know it. I didn't even know it because I had been so immersed in the religious lifestyle for so long that it actually took me a few weeks as I dug into his word with his Holy Spirit now indwelling in me for him to make it clear to me that I had never really known him. I had never given him my heart. But you know what? He wasn't finished. He wasn't finished at that conversion. But he passionately pursued a relationship with me. He was asking for every piece of my heart and my soul. And he wasn't really going to settle for anything less. I was on a bumpy path for a while, but why would I have expected anything differently? I mean, Jesus was shattering lifelong strongholds, and Satan was not happy about it. And then God started to ask me to do some things, and it wasn't because I needed to earn my salvation. It was because he wanted to give me confidence in my new life. He wanted to establish me. He wanted to strengthen me. And now that I belong to him, he was going to put away the old Mary because I really was a new person. I wish that I had time to walk you through that first year. It was incredible. It was incredible to begin to live in his life. The memorial stones were many, but one of the most powerful was being led to return to my childhood, both emotionally and ending in a physical visit to my hometown. So over those months, he tenderly walked me through forgiveness of many people repeatedly. And he showed me a really clear look backwards at his sovereign plan for my life. It was like a slow 
replay in my life the day that I got in that car and drove around my hometown with my sister. He showed me his faithfulness, how he had had his hand on me every moment of my life. And when I didn't know him, he knew me. He knew me. So now he continues the process of forming the new Mary, making me more like him. And just like in my marriage, progress has been lots and lots of baby steps forward and sometimes giant steps backwards. But you know what? He's become the lover of my soul. And I know that he is committed to finishing the work that he began in me. I am so grateful that it's never too late for his redeeming love to fall on us. I wish, I wish so much that I had really been his earlier in my life. And I sometimes imagine what that would have been like. But Jesus said in John 3 that no one understands how people are born of the Spirit and that the Spirit blows where it may. And in Isaiah 49, 8, he says, At just the right time, I heard you. At just the right time. And on the day of salvation, I helped you. His Holy Spirit's blown on me. And he heard my cries. He heard my husband's cries. And he's chosen and appointed me, weaving every minute of my life together for this very moment. And his timing is perfect. There's nothing that I can do to make it more perfect. And either he's sovereign or he's not. And that means he's sovereign in every minute of our lives. Jonathan Edwards said, the difference between believing that God is holy and gracious and tasting that God is holy and gracious is as different as the rational belief that honey is sweet and having that actual sense of sweetness on your tongue. The truth is, I've tasted that sweetness and I have fallen in love with Jesus. He has wooed me himself with his light. His light that's both overwhelming and alluring at the same time. He doesn't want our false religion, people. He wants our hearts. In Isaiah 29, 13, he says, These people say they are mine. They honor me with their lips, but their hearts are far from me. And their worship of me is nothing but man-made rules learned by rote. That was me. That was never his plan. He wanted my heart. And he was determined to have it before I was even formed. And he took time to win my heart. He didn't die just to save us. He's passionate for us. He wants relationships with us. He desires for us to pursue him and to desperately believe that he is worthy of that struggle. I just want to end with Psalm 63, just eight verses. God, you are my God, and I earnestly search for you. My soul thirsts for you. My whole body longs for you. In this parched and weary land where there is no water, I have seen you in your sanctuary, and I have gazed upon your power and glory. Your unfailing love is better than life itself. Oh, how I praise you. I praise you as long as I live, lifting up my hands to you in prayer. You satisfy me more than the richest feast. I will praise you with songs of joy. I lie awake thinking of you meditating on you through the night because you are my helper. I sing for joy in the shadow of your wings. I cling to you because your strong right hand holds me securely.
will stand and take your hymnals and turn to 343. You may not even need your hymnals. Amazing grace. meeting 
for the uh, purpose of electing and then uh, ordaining and installing the next elder class. With that said, Andy, you have a motion for us, sir? Thank you, sir. That's been in your newsletter for several weeks now, knowing about today. Are there any additional nominations from the floor? He asked with fear and trembling. No, if you have one, seriously, you may. Hearing none, I would entertain that uh, most uh, nominations cease and that we elect by acclamation. Somebody want to make that motion for us? So moved. I heard two or three so moved, we'll count that as a second. I'm going to ask the three of these men, uh, the two of these men and Miss Emily, I'm sorry about that, to join me down front. And as they're coming, all in favor then of the motion of electing them as our elder class of 2025, say aye. Aye. If you guys and gals, when she gets here, will join me here. I know it's COVID. Are you all comfortable with elders coming down and laying on hands, or we should get them close? Miss Emily, are you comfortable with elders coming down to lay on hands? Okay. I'm going to ask that in just a moment, all the other ordained elders and ministers that are here to come down for the laying on of hands. But first, I have a constitutional question for you. Do you believe the scriptures of the Old and New Testament to be the inspired word of God, the authority for faith and practice? Yes. And do you sincerely receive and adopt the confession of faith that comes to Presbyterian Church as containing the essential doctrines taught in the Holy Scriptures? Yes. And do you approve of and promise to uphold the government of the Cumberland Presbyterian Church? Yes. And do you promise to promote the peace, unity, and purity of the church? In participating as an elder in the judicatories of the church, and that would be session meeting, pastoral meeting, general assembly, and so on, and participating as an elder in the judicatories of the church, do you promise to share in a responsible way in decisions that are made and to abide by those decisions and to promote the welfare of the church? And do you accept the office of elder in this church and promise faithfully to discharge all the duties thereof as God may make you? Amen. I'm going to ask the other elders that are willing to come forward. I know we're tail end of flu and, and COVID too, but any elder that's willing to come forward, I'm going to have you guys kneel if possible so we can lay hands on you, and I'll pray the prayer of installation. I should have pointed out that uh, Doug is being ordained and, but all three are being installed as they have served in, in the past. Get around and let us pray. Father, we just pray for your power, for your spirit, for your anointing to come down upon these three new elders for the class of 2025. That you give them wisdom, that you give them knowledge, that you give them peace and hope. You give them vision for our future. Bless them as you bless all those serving on this session. Bless them in such a way that we truly have peace and unity so we can step forward and boldly into the future you have for us. And now, having taken these vows, having been voted in by this congregation, I declare that you are properly elected, ordained, and installed as the elder class of 2025. Amen. Amen. You may stand up and congratulations. We are proud to have you. We are now ready for our benediction, except I forgot one announcement earlier, but I'm going to ask you to stand with me as we close out with the benediction. And the announcement I forgot earlier is our small group Bible study is gathering tonight at 5 o'clock at uh, Scott and Amanda's home. And, and all those that participate in that are welcome to come. And I would say all those that like barbecued ribs are 
You're welcome to come, but I'm afraid I won't have any if I invite everyone. <laughs> I won't have enough if everybody comes. And nonetheless, thank you for being here this day, and may God's blessings be on you. And receive now this benediction. Believe in the risen Jesus, and live accordingly by allowing his spirit to draw you ever near him so that you can boldly proclaim your faith in him everywhere you go. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen.